like this. That's on a triangle. I like that. Good afternoon. Welcome. You know, you know what I you know what it is. It's my genealogy, and I have all this French Canadian genealogy. Like that. That's not air. That's not, no, that's not air. I've got a couple of things I've got to go through here. God forbid. Uh, this program is presented by the uh, New Hampshire Humanities Council. That's something I have to read. Uh, we are grateful to the New Hampshire Humanities Council for supporting this project, and we want to thank you for attending. New Hampshire Humanities is an independent nonprofit. Its work is statewide, but it is not a state agency. New Hampshire Humanities grants and programs support local organizations like this one. Each year, New Hampshire Humanities has sponsored more than 650 educational and cultural programs each year all over the state. Please be sure to write your comments on the evaluation forms provided. I believe there was one left in each uh, chair today. If you don't have one, let me know. We'll get one for you. Uh, include your name and contact information to be added to the New Hampshire Humanities list. Uh, let's see. Sorry. Thank you for coming. And it gives me great pleasure today to uh, introduce a gentleman by the name of Robert Perot. Professor Perot is a man who has pursued various careers as a librarian, archivist, freelance writer, historical tour guide, public speaker, photographer, and prolific author. He has published more than 160 articles and seven books. His volume, Franco-American Life and Culture in Manchester, New Hampshire, is the definitive word on the vibrant Franco-American culture many encountered on Elm Street in the 1950s and 1960s. We are very delighted to welcome Mr. Perot. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I also want to thank the Humanities Council over here, this banner, which the council wants all of you to see, because if it weren't for the council, I would not be here this afternoon. I also want to thank Steve Allman for having invited me to come here, and I want to thank all of you for having come to hear this. I have been going around giving talks, various talks for the Humanities Council now, since 1986 and believe me it's it's a pleasure because I'm a native of Manchester and through all these talks I get to visit places like Antrim and believe it or not I'm 67 years old and this is the first time I come to Antrim so if it weren't for the council I probably wouldn't have come here so I thank the council. Um, if we could have the lights and start the projector. I want to make sure everyone can see. Can you all see? Because now's the time to move. There are plenty of <laughs> seats over here. And can all everyone hear? Yep. You can all hear. OK, great. So um, we'll start with Quebec, because this is a program on the Franco-Americans, and where do the Franco-Americans come from? They came from Quebec. They also came from Acadia, but most people in New Hampshire tend to have descended from Quebec. These are a, a series of photographs that I have of vil a village in Quebec taken by an immigrant himself. This was Ulrich Bourgeois who was from the Eastern Townships in Quebec. He came to the United States as a photographer, so he wasn't a farmer like a lot of the people were, but he documented life in his native area. And so what we see here is the village of Fulford, Quebec, in the Eastern Townships where Bourgeois was born. Now this photograph and the photographs you're going to see for the next couple uh, of photographs are from the turn of the 20th century, but this, if, if photography had existed a hundred years before, you probably would have had the same 
pretty much the same view. People who migrated to New England came from small towns like this. Some might have come from larger cities like Montreal, but most came from small towns like this. So this is what it looked like, and please keep this image in your head because we're going to be contrasting that with another one a little bit later. People in small villages like this tended to speak French. They tended to be Roman Catholic. They tended to celebrate the same traditions, the same customs. Um, they also lived, mo for the most part, on farms, on land that they owned, and so they, they could control their own lives that way. But there was something missing in those lives, and that was usually money. Could we switch? Next slide. Farming was the main, uh, the main type of work, and this was a family type of work. Everyone got involved. You can see the children watching here, their grandfather. This is Bourgeois' father-in-law, by the way. And Bourgeois' daughter, who is this young lady right here, she's the one who shared her father's photographs with me. I met her in the 1970s when she was in her 70s, and so uh, we're fortunate to have these. Next. More work on the farm. And you see children working, and that's important because we'll, when we get to the mills, you'll see the same thing. Next. And occasionally, in order to bring in a little bit of money, sometimes a farmer could also do something else. In this case, this is Bourgeois' father, who was obviously here a blacksmith. So there's a little bit of money coming in. But for the most part, it's subsistence farming. This is not commercial farming. Next. And this is Bourgeois' mother-in-law. We're going to stop here and talk a little bit about her. Now she's, as I said, in her village. She's at home. She, has, she and her family own the land. They own the house. She's at a spinning wheel. She is most likely spinning either wool from the sheep that they have, their own sheep, or perhaps they're growing flax, and so she's spinning that. She will take those raw materials from her farm and use those materials to make clothing. Now, she's using her tools. She will perform every operation there is in the production of cloth. You can see from her clothing that most likely she didn't buy her clothing, she made her clothing. And she's working at home, therefore she can make her own work hours. She can take a break if she's tired, she can take a rest. She doesn't have to ask anyone's permission. She's working in a very clean environment, that is, it's, it's um, you know, she's breathing clean air, and it's, it's, a, it's a healthy place. Uh, there's not noise, it's, it's quiet. But, as I said at the end of the day, she doesn't have money for what she's doing, because she's doing it for her family. But she has pride in her work. She can point to the clothing that she's using and say, I made that with my hands, with my tools, every operation, with my raw materials and whatnot. So there's that identification between her work and her, her products and herself. Next. Now, what a contrast. This is Manchester. What a contrast this view is from that original photograph that you saw at the beginning with the old houses and the little road going through. Now, these people, in order to make some money, they're hearing stories about places like Manchester, and it's not just Manchester, it's Berlin, New Hampshire, it's Nashua, New Hampshire, it's Lowell, Massachusetts, and I could name many, many cities and towns that had uh, industry going on in the 19th century and in the early 20th century that were attracting people 
from places like Quebec. And Quebec is just one of those places because there were people coming from uh, all over Europe as well. And so this is, imagine the culture shock that it must have been for these people to come from little towns in Quebec to this, these large, a large city like, uh, I mean, I, I, I myself am from Manchester, and when I go to New York City, it's like a big city. Well, this is what it must have been for the, those people to come from the small villages to uh, a place like Manchester. These large mills and a lot of noise and pollution and whatnot. But they were coming here for economic reasons, and so they stayed. Next. And the workers working in places like the Amiskeg Manufacturing Company, the largest textile manufacturing company in the world, with people like themselves, but coming from all different cultures. So you have not just people from Quebec, but people from Poland and Greece and Ireland and Germany and Sweden. In fact, there was, in 1916, a journalist spent an entire week in these mills and at the end he wrote an article in which he said he heard this is 1916 now 28 different languages spoken in these mills so you can just imagine what it would have been like for the people coming from all these different cultures from different religions different traditions different ways of thinking and there had to have been clashes, you know, culture, culture classes. And yet somehow they all had to get together and make cloth for the Amiskeg Manufacturing Company. And of course people worked in other industries as well. The shoe industry was very big as well. Next. Now, remember the lady at the spinning wheel. Now this is not the same lady, but we'll pretend it's the same lady. So how has her life changed? Well, first of all, she's not living in uh, a house that she owns, that her family owns. Chances are she's living in an ethnic neighborhood, in, a, in what is a little Canada. And there were other neighborhoods, uh, little Greece or little Poland or little Ireland or whatever. So here she is in a mill. She's not working at home. She doesn't own her land. She doesn't own the raw materials like the wool or the flax that she was using. She doesn't have her own uh, tools the way she did back home. And she's just doing one repetitive operation. In this case, she's between looms here, so you can tell that she's a weaver. Whereas at home, she was doing the the carding and the combing and the spinning and the weaving and whatever else. Here she's just doing that one repetitive operation of weaving. It's noisy in the mill. Anybody here ever come work in a textile mill or visit a textile mill? You know what it's like in a weave room. Those, will, those mills going click, clack, click, clack, click, clack, click, clack. And when you've got several hundred of those looms going all at the same time. It's deafening, and people would go deaf very young because of working there. So you've got that noise. You've got cotton dust. Amiskeg was, they, they had wool, but they also mainly was cotton, and you've got cotton dust that you're breathing, and so that could cause all kinds of lung diseases and whatnot. Um, she couldn't take a break. Uh, when she wanted to. She had to work, in fact, in the early, early days, like in the 19th century, they were working six in the morning till six at night. That's 12 hours, six days a week, 72 hours. Now, little by little, the mills came down in their work week. It was very gradual, but down to 48 hours. So, from 72 to 48, but that took many years. So you can just imagine what it was like to not be at home, not be able to 
work the way you wanted to at your own pace or whatnot. You had to go in when the mills told you to go in, when that mill bell would ring in the morning and summon you. And if you wanted to take a break, you'd have to ask your boss. And if your boss was a nice guy, maybe they'd let you, and if the boss were not, you couldn't. And so that's what her life is like. But what does she have? Money at the end. She has a, a, a pay. So that was important for her. Now, you saw children working on the farm. Here, children are working in the mill. Now, I know it's shocking for people to see that, but kids as young as eight and nine years old working in the mills, but they were accustomed to it. In those days, that's just how it was. So by our standards today, this would be shocking, but that's the way it was. And these, uh, this photograph is part of a series by Lewis Hine, who went around the country taking pictures of uh, young children working in the mills in order to try to attract, uh, to uh, enact uh, child labor laws. Now children were hired oftentimes because they have little hands, little fingers, and they could do certain things that bigger hands couldn't do, just, you know, uh, threading and things like that. But kids could also uh, be undisciplined. Obviously children are children, right? So even though the machinery is dangerous, there were oftentimes accidents, kids would lose fingers or hands or whatever it was, so it was, it was really something dangerous and eventually child labor laws were enacted and so uh, this sort of thing couldn't uh, continue. Next. But it wasn't all drudgery either. There were, I mean these people here look quite happy and, and oftentimes people would say, well, you know, I found my spouse in the mills. That's where we met and I had done a number of interviews when I first got out of college my first job was working for the authors of the book Amiskeg Life and Work in an American Factory City so I had to go out and interview former Amiskeg workers and they told me sometimes well you know it was drudgery but we tried to make the best of it and so when the boss wasn't looking sometimes you know the boys would chase the girls around the around the spinning frames or whatever it was and so um, you know, this is one happy couple here anyway, so it wasn't entirely bad. Next. And here's uh, a typical family um, on their porch steps. You can see there's three generations here living together. Um, in Canada, that's the way it would have been, living on a farm. They'd live three. And I know in my family, I have a, an uncle who told me he remembered having a great-grandmother still living there. So, you know, they were living four generations under the same roof. They would build these houses. You can see there are three um, uh, mailboxes and three doorbells there. So it's a, it's a triple-decker, three, uh, three apartments. Um, so s people would rent apartments in these types of buildings, or some aspired to actually own one. So if they lived for a certain number of years in the city and they had, you know, pooled their money because they had large families, they'd pool their money and the large families, the kids would be working in the mills giving all their money to their parents so that they could end up buying a house like this and then um, either the, the entire family would um, occupy the house, you know, you might have the older, uh, the, the main old couple living downstairs and then maybe some of the older children with the grandchildren living on the upper floors or sometimes they could, they knew people from their own village who would move to their neighborhood and actually rent an apartment from them so that these neighborhoods, like a little Canada, it was like a, a bunch of families and friends all living along the same street or whatnot. Next. So to give you an example of some of the buildings, this is a multi-family house. You could have uh, 10 or 12 apartments. Next. This was the more typical one um, type of house, either uh, two family uh, or maybe if, if they had made on the third floor, not an attic, but actually a small apartment. It could be a 
three families. Some of them had a flat roof up top so they could have a full apartment. Some even had four stories. Um, these were the type, the, the more typical houses. Next. And in the very poorest section, this is what was called the flat iron district. This was actually a small French downtown neighborhood. Now Manchester is separated by uh, the river, the Merrimack River. So the downtown area is along Elm Street on the east side. This is on the west side, being the French uh, neighborhood. And what you had were uh, downstairs on the ground floors, you'd have uh, all kinds of shops, you know, the little small grocery stores and little restaurants and cafes and uh, barber shop, tailor shop, uh, print shop, whatever it was. So that was all commercial downstairs. And then upstairs you had tenements. Uh, so people were actually living above these stores. And th this was the kind of neighborhood where you could just walk down the street and hear French spoken on a daily basis. Um, this neighborhood, unfortunately though, was um, torn down in the 1960s because the city had this uh, urban renewal plan to rid itself of uh, several of the poorest neighborhoods and this was um, one of the poorest neighborhoods in the, in the, in the uh, city. So today it's all parking lots, uh, basically. If, if you know anything about Manchester, it's where the uh, CMC, Catholic Medical Center, is. So it's the parking lot of uh, Catholic Medical Center so, and St. Mary's Bank, which, by the way, St. Mary's Bank was founded in Manchester by Franco-Americans in St. Marie's Parish as the very first credit union in the United States, 1908. Next. This is just another view to give you a closer look at what these uh, apartments look like. So you, got, you see a drugstore down here and there's some other shops there and then the tenements upstairs. And uh, this was uh, the modern theater across the street there. So they did have a, one, a movie house there. Uh, you see a picture of uh, Edward G. Robinson there. So Next. Now, the people I've talked about so far have tended to be farmers who were looking for a better life coming down to work in the mills. But when that movement became so large, uh, in 1869, for example, there were 1,500 immigrants from Quebec living in Manchester people like this man, this was Ferdinand Gagnon, or Ferdinand Gagnon. Um, he was a journalist. He came down from Quebec in 1869, that same year, realizing that he had an education. So he was a journalist. He came down and he founded the very first French language newspaper in Manchester. Next, show it. Which was called La Voix du Peuple. The Voice of the People, 1869. Um, this was a way of trying to serve the population, in other words. They, when they realized, when, when business people and professional people in French Canada realized that this immigration to the United States was going to be something permanent, they fe felt that they had services that they could offer these populations, and so they migrated, and Gagnon was one of the first of that class to come down to Manchester, but this was a disaster. It, it lasted seven months from February 16, 1869 to September 1869, and the reason for it being a flop was because it was just too early. People were not ready for a newspaper. People were working as I said, 12 hours a day in the mills, and they had large families, and when you get home from work, and you've got oh, you know, 12 kids or 15 kids to take care of, you don't have time to be reading the newspaper, if you even know how to read, because a lot of people were illiterate. So eventually, Mr. Gagnon 
uh, moved on to Worcester, Massachusetts, where he had several more failures, and finally he founded a newspaper in Worcester, Massachusetts, called Le Travailleur, which means the laborer, and that one was successful. And he's known today as the father of the Franco-American press, because he his work finally um, inspired the creation of around 350 French language newspapers all over New England. So, next. And newspapers were not used only to uh, give out the news in French. I mean, we're talking international news and uh, national news and state news and local news and that sort of thing. But they were also used for different reasons. There was, um, for example, they, uh, they had, uh, like, um, you know, Charles Dickens used to publish his novels in serial form, sort of like a soap opera, you know, you read, you read a chapter and then it leaves you with a cliffhanger so that you'll buy the next day's newspaper and you find out what happened. Well, the French were doing that too. And it was called, in French, it was called a roman feuilleton, which is basically just a, like a soap opera type um, uh, chapter. Um, they encouraged poetry as well, but also propaganda. And this is a page that just shows, it says Manchester and its advantages for the Canadians. And so what you were supposed to do in this newspaper, you were supposed to cut this out and mail it off to your relatives in Canada so that they would come down because, and you see there's a picture of a pastor there and there's a church um, and they're showing Amoskeg Falls, that's, what, that's the water power for the mills and all. Because in, in French Canada, they were seeing their population literally bleeding down into New England. Uh, between 1866 and 1875, 50,000 Quebec residents left Quebec per year in those years to come down and live in the United States, and a lot of them ended up in places like Manchester. So pastors, Catholic pastors, would get up in the pulpit on Sunday and say, stop going down there. This, this United States is a Protestant country, and you're going to lose your faith, and you're going to lose your language and your culture and all that. And people were saying, well, yeah, but, you know, we have, they have churches down there, and they have schools, and they have... French newspapers, and we're not going to lose our culture. And this is what this was all about, was to build up an entire cultural network of churches, of schools, of newspapers, of clubs and organizations, of businesses, all in French, so that people could keep their language and their faith. Speaking of faith, here is the typical founding pastor. This is Monsignor Heavey, who came uh, first, actually, from he came from Canada, but went to Lewiston, Maine, founded a parish there. And then when he thought he was going to retire, the bishop said, no, you did such a good job in Lewiston, Maine, we're going to send you to Manchester, where he founded St. Marie's Parish. Next. St. Marie's Parish, which is still there today. Um, one of the most beautiful churches in Manchester, and I would say even in New England. Uh, next, show the interior. It hasn't changed. This is, this is uh, an early photograph, but it hasn't changed. In fact, my wife and I, she's running the projector over there. We were married in this church in 1981, in French. So, um, you know, the culture is still there. Um, but when you look at this, this is really, I see this as a statement. I said that faith was important, language was important, faith was especially important um, because in Quebec, when the English conquered Quebec in 1759, they attempted to get the Canadian citizens, the French Canadian citizens, to adopt Protestantism and to adopt the English language. And the F 
French said, no, our culture is French and we're Catholic and we're going to stay that way. And so this whole ideology was born out of this resistance and it was called survivance, which means survival. And so this, I think, the richness of this building, this church, in contrast with people working in mills, because it's the people working in mills for small salaries, building this says a lot. It says that how, what was important to these people. Today, I don't think you could build a church like this. I really don't. This is, you know, one big sacrifice, I think, for these people. Next. And just to show how important faith was, they would even have uh, uh, religious ceremonies outside. This is a mass. You can see the, the, uh, the altar over here. And people are outside. And there's a mill right there. So they're showing the world on the outside that their faith is important to them. Next. And the next thing after founding a church would be to found a school. And so the nuns would teach. Now, in this particular parish, the nuns were teaching the girls and the brothers. Next. The brothers were teaching the boys. Now, in some parishes, like in mine, for example, we had nuns teaching both the boys and the girls. So it depended on the parish. Now, these schools, the, these parochial schools, were bilingual. So you had half a day of French and half a day of English. And you had to know, when you entered first grade at age six, you had to know both English and French, theoretically speaking. Now, there were kids whose families had, now when I came to school, I, I was in grammar school here, from 1957 to 65, when my generation came along, there were still kids coming in from French Canada, the very few. Um, they knew French, but they didn't know English. Other kids had been in Manchester or somewhere else in, in the United States um, for several generations. And I always say, with each generation, you put a little bit more American water in your French wine. So you'd be losing a little bit more of your language. And then there were the kids who were like kind of in between, and I was like that. My family spoke French at home, but as kids we spoke, French, we spoke English on the outside, so we had perfected both languages. But we were in these schools to learn to read and write the two languages that we were supposed to already possess at age six in the first grade. So, and the most important subject was religion, catechism. That's, that was the number one reason these schools existed. Because catechism, it was, as I said, faith was important. And so